roughly a year ago, we finished up a white paper, and this was maybe six months of uh, discussions with members of the IARPIC community and uh, a fair amount of talking amongst ourselves also. Uh, that's interesting. There we go. Thankfully, Richard Cullither is on the line also today. I say thankfully because uh, some of my brain cells have kind of forgotten a, a fair amount of the material that we discussed a year ago, and Richard might recall a few things that I've forgotten. And of course, um, frankly, he did uh, a lot more work than, than I did on this. So he'll also be able to contribute if I space on some of the material here. But we had uh, five leads on this, and I'd like to thank our other members, David Bromwich from Ohio State, Jingren Wu, who was a key member of the team that produced the climate forecast system reanalysis, um, a slightly older reanalysis with the NOAA, and Patrick Taylor from NASA. So here are the main things that we were asked to do uh, to evaluate uh, the utilization limitations of Arctic reanalyses to provide an inventory and assess the currently planned operational experimental observations uh, as they relate to reanalyses, examine how we might improve them, and then make linkages as we thought appropriate to YAP and CMEP6. Um, so IARPIC contacted uh, several of us in NOAA and NASA as co-leads, uh, as potential co-leads, we volunteered. We're happy to have served in the capacity to produce this white paper. And again, we had several community meetings leading up to our internal discussions. Here's just a, a big picture of the white paper, the um, executive summary uh, and introduction, and then a background on reanalyses. That was the section where I did a fair amount of work, and I can't help but emphasize the things that I know more about, which is more on the assimilation techniques. So as we go through the content here, I'll, I'll spend a little extra time on that. We also have a section on reanalyses and the observations, what's assimilated, what's not, how we might get new observations in there, and a section on assessment of current reanalyses, future developments, and potential improvements. So some background on reanalyses here. First, uh, what reanalyses are out there? Here's table one from the white paper. And it shows you that amongst the various global organizations, largely dominated by meteorological um, weather prediction facilities, but not exclusively so, um, there are now a fairly wide variety of reanalyses. Now, because a lot of these have been developed by weather prediction centers, they often are kind of tailored towards the reanalysis needs related to weather prediction not necessarily tailored for climate monitoring Arctic reanalysis purposes. And that will come out as we talk through some of these issues uh, in the rest of the slides. So some challenges with reanalyses. This is not reanalysis data, but one year of analysis data. So what I've done here is I have collected a year of two meter temperature analyses from various global systems. This is the ECMWF system, our NOAA NCEP system, the UK Met Office in Canada. And so at each day, this is zero Z data, um, I'm taking the analysis and determining how different these are from each other, and then plotting then an average over the 365 days. And I show you this plot to illustrate that as we look in the Arctic region, you see that these colors are showing that there's a fair amount of spread uh, of differences between the reanalysis systems. And this spread is probably indicative of significant uncertainty in the reanalysis. So whereas reanalysis may be doing a better job over data rich areas in Europe and the United States, the data poor areas um, and um, are, are particularly challenged, and, and that's reflected in the Arctic. Now let's look at a time series over Greenland. So if you can see my mouse, I'm picking a point that's up here roughly over central Greenland. The um, 
thinner lines are the actual time series of data at zero Z from four different operational centers. And then the larger lines are with a plus or minus 15 day smooth on the data. The reason I show this to you is that um, you can see several what appear to be systematic differences amongst these reanalysis. So NCEPT, for example, up here over central Greenland is uh, when you do a time average consistently warmer than the Met Office by perhaps three or four C here in uh, a key time when you're interested in snow melt over Greenland. The system seemed to pick up the synoptic fluctuations, the fluctuations related to the passing of weather systems. So for example, they've all sort of got it warmer than normal here in mid-February, followed by a colder than average period in early March and so forth. But averaged out over time, there are these biases. And um, I th presume that that mean state, that mean temperature and other mean properties are very important. And this just highlights um, why we are interested in reanalyses and the sort of care that one must take when choosing and using reanalysis data. Now, what's underlying problems like this? In part, it is the lack of data in the system but it's not solely the lack of data. Now, what I'm showing you here is, let's say that we have started off with an analysis at some time here, and we're going to follow the forecast in time. What one sees in the forecast is that just in the very early hours of the forecast, especially in situations over the Arctic, we often jump quite notably and then have a slower, more transient behavior. And what is happening with this jump is that the atmospheric temperature that's been inserted is inconsistent with the temperature of the ground state or the snow or ice state. And so quickly, the temperature rebalances to the state of that underlying surface. And this is going to be a challenge until we have more sophisticated reanalysis schemes, such that if you have a good piece of surface information, it's also making an adjustment to the temperature of that soil or of that snowpack. Um, so as you can see, you know, you can then assimilate a piece of observations here and drive the temperature toward that observation, but the process tends to repeat itself. And again, the forecast kind of jumps back to its own internal um, soil or snow climatology. Um, now, do any systems have uh, a way to take that atmospheric observation data and make an increment to the soil? Uh, some do, for example, ECMWF do a surface temperature analysis and then use the increments from their surface temperature. That's the adjustment that's made in the data simulation system to make an adjustment to the soil state. Uh, and more sophisticated methods are on the way. But this highlights one of the methodological challenges that we are, are dealing with. Another methodological challenge is that we typically make assumptions that errors are normally distributed. Perhaps we have an observation here with an implied error distribution shown in the orange curve. The forecast, or what we call the background, is the got a value here with an implied error shown in the blue curve. And you can convolve these distributions to produce an analyzed state and an implied analysis error distribution. And this all works very quickly and efficiently if data is normally distributed. But you know, for Arctic processes, you may be interested in cloud uh, properties, and it may well be that you run an ensemble of forward of, of forecasts, and some of those ensemble members uh, integrated a short period of time to the next data simulation cycle are showing you zero clouds, other are showing you significant clouds, and that non-normality is a very challenging thing to deal with in current data simulation schemes. And in fact, it's going to give you unrealistic results there that don't look like either um, the cluster here or the cluster at zero, but something that's in between. So moving on here, I'll, let me just stop and say, is there any questions with that material?
Okay, I'll move on to reanalyses and observations. This is um, Phil Rash. Could I ask a question also? In in showing the discrepancy between the various analysis products, can I just ask you, did you map all of the analysis products to approximately the same resolution before you uh, did the analysis, or could some of it be explainable in terms of the differences in the various products resolution? They're certainly not produced all on the same grid. They were all interpolated to the same grid, and especially in mountainous regions like the Himalayas, I would expect that you know the different underlying terrain representations in the modeling systems is resulting in some of that difference. Yeah, even but when over you're over a rather smooth area like the Greenland ice sheet, I think it's really um, partly you know the problem that I explained, which was challenges with the land surface, and also the fact that these modeling systems typically don't have two meters as an analyzed level. They may have a skin level and then a level higher than two meters and there's some interpolation involved and each center may choose to do it differently. So Thanks. those are kind of what I would expect for the underlying things that were affecting that, that Greenland time series. Other questions or comments? Okay, so going on to reanalyses and observations, obviously uh, observations are critical. Um, and we need uh, observations both remotely sensed and especially in situ observation. And for those of you who are collecting observations or represent others that are collecting observations, um, it's fair to say that, you know, the collection of the observations only gets you part way there. There's also a fair amount of work involved with getting these into um, a state where they can either be assimilated operationally or used in reanalyses. And I'll talk about that as we go along. Looking at a time series of um, data over the Arctic Ocean, for a long period of time, the Soviets had um, some drifting stations but they were stopped, they stopped being maintained in 1991. And so about that time you see a notable drop off in the number of observations. And while that's rebounded slightly in recent years, there's obviously been a paucity of observations in the recent past that we haven't fully recovered from here. Now, many other observing systems have come online here. So for example, you're seeing in green um, upper air observations, and most of these points are coming from plane tracks. There are sensors on board a lot of the commercial aircraft, and so as they fly great circles, they at least kind of come relatively close to polar regions, if not directly flying over the pole. Um, and there's more surface-based observations in the very recent years here. This is 2007 data here. If we look at a time series of observations, these uh, sort of um, hatched blue are what we call atmospheric motion vectors. This is where you take a sequence of satellite images and note how clouds appear to have moved in those images and then assign motion vectors and from infrared information you can also infer the height of that cloud layer. And uh, so a lot of the data that we get from satellites that is not directly radiance data are these atmospheric motion vectors. And um, these are sort of waxing and waning. I think that they're on the increase again in, in the very most recent years. Um, but uh, that's been a predominant data source, but these atmospheric motion vectors typically are picking up things, you know, that um, are either high mid-level clouds, sometimes low clouds, but often not really right near the surface where you want the data. And as you look through the other aircraft information or the other information rayops and profilers, you see that they're a little more constant in time. Um, the RAYOB data diminishes in the 1990s, again, consistent with that Soviet network. Any questions here?
And then looking at how these are distributed across latitude bands, you note the general paucity of observations in the Arctic here. There's more bounteous data in the mid latitudes, obviously with more population, more planes flying across these areas and so forth. Now we do have a lot of satellite data. Um, though as you would hope with the reanalysis where you cover a long period of time, this network has been changing drastically over time. So before 1999, there's really little or no radiance data that's of use. In recent years, we have a lot of different satellite systems between the US, Europe, Japan, and even now China uh, fielding microwave and infrared radiance uh, instruments. We also have GPS met radio occultations. These are constellations of satellites that look through the atmosphere and by determining the amount of bending that's occurred through the atmosphere, they can back out a, a temperature, moisture profile. We have scatterometers, uh, ozone spectrometry, and more. Um, one of the challenges with use of this data though is that it is more challenging to use them in regions where there are clouds. And you need to be able to really well model the cloud, the type of cloud, the particle distributions and clouds and such in order to use the satellite data in those regions. And obviously the Arctic is quite cloudy at many times of year and that hinders the use of this data, especially down low in the atmosphere over the Arctic. Now, there's plenty of data that's collected, but it may not be assimilated. That's for a couple different reasons. Um, if it's not on our global telecommunications system, it's not going to be assimilated. So one needs a mechanism for getting it up there. But even so, it may well, if it's attempted to be put on the GTS, um, they may be excluded. So for example, in ERA interim, near surface winds are typically excluded because of the very significant subgrid scale variability there, what we call representativeness. Uh, similarly, surface pressure observations over high terrain, um, RAOB data that ends up below the model surface. We typically used a smooth version of the um, terrain in our prediction system rather than the real terrain, and a couple other um, pieces of observations. And that's ERA interim. When you look at our own NCEP systems, we're behind the European Center and we exclude even more data. So for example, we don't use surface temperature uh, data directly in the system. And for this reason, this is something that a, a user of reanalysis products need to understand. So if they're looking for a really high quality surface temperature analysis, let's say to drive um, you know, mass balance over Greenland, then they should be examining the strengths and weaknesses of the various reanalyses rather than just choosing one um, without um, thought as to whether surface temperature analysis is being done carefully in that system. Any questions here? Okay, so let's suppose that you have collected observations. Um, some may not be all that useful because they may not measure something that's directly related to the model state, the winds, the humidity, the temperature. So um, if you're taking measurements that let's say are informing Arctic processes, those may be great for illuminating problems with the forecast model, but they may not be directly useful in the assimilation system. So before going through a lot of effort to try to get those onto the GTS, it's worth considering, um, are they actually going to be something that is useful for changing the state of these basic variables, winds and humidity and temperature and so forth. Another thing is that 
if you've taken observations and they're available only for a short period of time, that can be great, but it's not as useful as having those observations over a much longer period of time. Because of course, we're interested in monitoring, monitoring um, changes over time and variability. Uh, observations are particularly valuable if they're not measuring uh, something that we're already measuring pretty well. So observations, for example, that are measuring the polar stratosphere are not nearly as helpful because those are done well with radiance data as observations that are measuring right down near the surface. Uh, if you do have observations that you think are useful for reanalyses, uh, typically it's important to work with reanalysis providers to get it into a convenient format. And if possible, just to get it onto the GPS so that they're available in real time. If you can't do that, uh, there's an archive at NCAR, but not all reanalysis providers commonly access that before going to work on their reanalyses. Another thing to note is that you typically need a forward operator. This is um, a piece of code that converts, if you're doing some exotic type of observation, from the model space, these U's and V's and winds and, uh, excuse me, and temperature and humidity, into that exotic type of observation. And uh, if you dump the data on a reanalysis generator without that forward operator, they may say, we really can't take it unless it's a simple thing to develop that. Okay, assessment of current reanalyses. Um, obviously, they're very commonly used despite the known flaws. Um, partly this is because they provide something unique. These are gridded fields at multiple vertical levels that kind of hang together. They're consistent over time and space. And that allows you to do things like uh, budgets that you might not be able to do otherwise. Um, there are evaluations of Arctic reanalyses. More is needed. And there are plenty of systematic deficiencies that we note in the reanalyses. Uh, in particular, moisture, precipitation, and clouds are not well treated in current reanalyses, as I mentioned before, near surface air temperatures. And then another problem, which I haven't yet touched on, which are temporal discontinuities. So ideally, if you're generating, let's say, a 30-year reanalysis, you would start at the beginning of that 30-year and just sequentially march through time. But practically, to compute these things, you break them up into what we call streams. Perhaps you're computing chunks in two-year or five-year segments. And unfortunately, it's a common property of reanalyses to see some uh, discontinuities in the analyses at the boundaries of these streams. And that's something that, you know, is a known problem that's being worked on by reanalysis providers. But even with concerted effort, it's not going to go away tomorrow. There will be some problems like this. Um, continuing on, a variety of uh, phenomena are not well spatially resolved. So let's say flow um, at the boundaries of ice sheets may be particularly problematic, or um, polar lows may be barely resolved in, in these systems. And let's see here. I think rather than reading this, I'll just continue on. I think I'm running a little long here. Another thing that, again, I would like to ask users of reanalysis to remember is that a lot of the providers are weather prediction centers. And a reanalysis they produce may not be produced with climate users in mind, people that are interested in monitoring changes over time. In my case, I'm working to generate a reanalysis, and this is for initializing retrospective forecasts so that we can improve sub-seasonal and seasonal forecasts. And other, I optimize for other qualities, such as um, the ability of the system to produce high-quality forecasts, that it doesn't have uh, 
small scale variability that contaminates the early hours of the forecast, for example. So knowing that, uh, one has to use such data with care. So future development, uh, we can expect Arctic reanalyses to increase in horizontal and vertical resolution to include better physics, especially better cloud physics. Um, we expect to increase the usage of new uh, data types and existing observations. And ideally, we would do regional higher resolution Arctic reanalyses that are really tailored in a way that some of these global reanalyses are not to the needs of this Arctic community here. And so that was one of the key points that we wanted to emphasize. If given that so much research is dependent upon these Arctic reanalyses, it would be nice to have reanalysis products that are really tailored to that application. There also is significant work going on in developing more coupled systems. This is not only coupling the ocean and the atmosphere, but better coupling the data simulation between the land and the atmosphere, the, the sea ice, the um, aerosol content, and even at longer time scales in the carbon cycle. So we've identified many topics that we think will potentially improve Arctic reanalyses. Uh, number one up there again is a next generation of reanalyses really focused on the problems of the Arctic. Uh, improving our ability to predict clouds, since that really is very intimately related to the surface energy budget. Uh, and I'll just let you read through the rest of these, I guess. And we'll, um, I think, end it there. Richard, do you have anything that you would like to add that you sort of draw as particularly important from the white paper? Um, not at this time. Perhaps, perhaps we could go to questions and maybe I could remember something. OK, well, let's take some questions if you have them. Okay, I know Richard is gonna present a few slides uh, related to um, some more recent work and, and thoughts that he's given. So um, do we move on to that or? Uh, or? Yeah, Tom, this is Ace. Can I jump in for a second? And I wanna to, want to just say from my own perspective how uh, this is a terrific presentation. I think the, the white paper itself is an impressive effort. Uh, wanted to ask, I think Renu Joseph, the um, one of the co-leads of the modeling group is online now. Um, to, Renu, are you there? Uh oh, <laughs> I thought. And, uh, but it. She's there. If, if not. She's, she's on the line, it looks like she's muted. Okay. In that case. Uh, Renu, can you hear us? I just unmuted her. Oh, uh, can you hear go. me? We can hear you now. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Thank you. Um, yes, I I have a question for Tom, and then I I I, I wouldn't. My, I mean, I'd love to introduce uh, Richard. Uh, my question for Tom is: uh, You did talk about um, how reanalysis uh, it can be targeted for different. Uh, um, needs and uh, your previous slide, not this current one, the previous slide talked about, uh, um, you know, mixed phase clouds. So is there something you can think of that would improve, help improve uh, the representation of mixed phase clouds in, uh, in a reanalysis? And if so, what are they? Um, Okay, so I will confess, first of all, that I'm not an expert in cloud microphysics, but I think uh, this is probably, if I recall correctly, David Bromwich emphasizing this. And I think the model developments, improving microphysical parameterizations, allows you to make a better forward operator, uh, so, so, well, not better forward operator, but when the forward operator 
operates on the model state to develop an estimate of a radiance, it's doing so more informed by the correct physical processes. So in terms of our data simulation community, our data simulation community is, I think, looking to people who are developing these advanced microphysical parameterizations, and for this community, especially ones relevant to the Arctic. And with those incorporated into the forecast systems that are cycled in reanalyses, that will improve our ability to make uh, uh, better predictions of the state of the atmosphere. I guess one other aspect is that, you know, in, in simpler systems, we're not actually keeping track of things like um, particle concentrations and such, and more sophisticated weather prediction systems of the future, that may become part of the model state that is forecast forward in time and updated with observations. So this is Richard, let me just comment on this. Um, so one of the issues with representing cloud, uh, mix, mixed phase clouds um, is uh, having both constituents present at the same time. So in many atmospheric models, um, the uh, distinguishment between um, liquid clouds and ice clouds is done on a temperature threshold. Uh, so a very simplistic uh, parameterization. And so that's where you, you tend to get into trouble. Um, other se se several centers, NCAR, and we have uh, attempted to implement um, what's known as two-moment cloud microphysics, where the phase of the cloud is determined not only by the temperature, but also in a more explicit representation of the ice physics through the uh, representation of the aerosols, uh, the aerosol distribution. Uh, the problem is that um, representations of aerosols are very difficult to obtain for the Arctic. Um, most aerosols which are used in our reanalyses are obtained from MODIS, and so you need some type of sunlight to understand uh, what the, the aerosol distribution is, and so that information can be lacking. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you were on the line to provide clarification. Thank you, Richard. So this is, this is Phil Rash, and um, I found the presentation can you guys hear me? I guess that's the first question, yeah? Yes. Okay, so I found the presentation interesting as well, and I guess, uh, so as somebody who's helped to develop those cloud and aerosol parameterizations for models, um, I was thinking as I saw the presentation about um, what is most important for me, and, um, and I, I recognize the difficulty of making measurements of those things, so I was interested in as well in uh, um, characterization of which which of the various reanalysis products might be um, more and less accurate for which processes. And I'm sorry to say I, I tuned in about three or four minutes late, so I didn't get to hear the intro to it. But um, among the kind of quantities that I'm most interested in would be things like um, surface radiative fluxes, the short, the short and long wave upward and downward fluxes, the um, aerial ex or the frequency of occurrence of clouds, um, surface wind speeds, and um, perhaps precipitation rates if they're available as well. And I'm just wondering, did you, in, did you in your kind of, kind of in the white paper or the assessment of the various analysis products attempt to verify the uh, quality or lack of quality of some of these fields that I'm mentioning, which in turn will be really responsive to the presence or absence of the aerosols and the clouds. Um, did you did you try for that kind of an assessment as well? And oh, one last question or uh, remark is just to say, you emphasize the fact that there are a lot of past observations which haven't been used in the prior Arctic reanalysis products, but, and so that's a unfortunate situation in one respect, but it's also um, an opportunity in another respect, because those things can be used as uh, part of the verification process for the quality of the reanalysis products also. So I'm just wondering whether people have looked at it from that perspective also. <laughs> 
sorry, that was a lot to uh, ask you to respond to. Um, I have some knee-jerk reactions, but you might have a little more informed, Richard. Do you want to make any comments, sir? I can try. I think most reanalyses are compromised in some way in the Arctic, and so there's no very, there's no straight answer. Um, a lot of that depends on what time period you're looking at. Um, a lot of people believe that the ECMWF interim reanalyses have superior rate of flexes. They certainly have superior precipitation, um, but um, they, their sea ice uh, boundary layer or their sea ice boundary conditions um, are compromised um, for an extended period of time. Uh, prior to 2009, they had 100% sea ice concentration over a large portion of the Arctic erroneously at all times of year. So um, the answer is that you know it depends. Um, I guess I guess that's the easiest way to say it. Um, with regards to your second question, which I didn't. Uh, fully follow, I'm sorry, but um, you were asking about um, earlier observations. And since our report, I've received a lot of information, I guess you could say an earful from um, some of the data assimilation people around here. And uh, so the incorporation of additional observations or, or even exotic observations um, is balanced by increasing the uncertainty in your data assimilation system. And so there can be quite a bit of pushback from the uh, data analysis uh, people as far as you know what new observations need to go in. You need to have some type of a constraint on what the uncertainties are for those measurements um, and how it affects the uncertainty for your, your whole reanalysis system. So I guess those were the points I wanted to make. Okay, thank you for that. I think European Center is, you know, got this project that they spun off called Copernicus, and part of this is producing an, a more climate-oriented reanalysis, ERA CLIM, and I think that newer versions of their reanalyses may have addressed some of the deficiencies that um, Richard meant, mentioned and may be worth closer look. Generally, I think the Europeans are out ahead, but as Richard pointed out, not for everything. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of an assessment of the quality of reanalyses, it really wasn't our perceived job to like tackle new research in that regard, but we did provide um, a number of references in that white paper to others who have done some inner comparisons. And so I'd encourage you to, to look at those if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I would, I, I guess, I would also add that um, all uh, this was a non-funded project. So it was a non-funded project. So we didn't, uh, we didn't conduct an extensive uh, survey of of the other reanalyses. Um, all of the um, the contributors, or I guess four of the contributors, are associated with the production of reanalyses. So perhaps each of us would say that our own reanalysis was superior. Um, I certainly would say that you should always use Mira too. <laughs> Funny, I wouldn't say that you should always use the um, reanalysis that I'm producing. I, I recognize the warts as, as we go along through our, our scout run process right now. Mm -hmm. um, th th thanks a lot uh, for the discussion. 